everyone. Hello, can you hear us? Perfect. Good afternoon. How is everyone doing in KubeCon in-person event? Woohoo! <laughs> and of course, everyone at home that's watching us, wherever we are in the world, it's a morning, afternoon, midday, night, everyone watching us from everywhere, so that's fantastic uh, to be here. Annie, would yeah. you like to kick this off? Perfect. Very much a welcome on our part to our session, how event-driven auto-scaling in Kubernetes can combat climate change. We are super excited to be here. The topic is very close to our hearts, and we hope that it's close to your hearts as well. And one of the reasons why we are super excited to be here as well is because the topic is very closely connected to the, this year's KubeCon theme, so resilience realized. And I think it's, um, well, climate change, what could be more of a topic where resilience is actually needed and where it's a very important topic. So today we will take you on a journey through how event-driven auto-scaling can actually make a difference in climate change. Uh, and this really connects to the fact that if we use our compute, if we, use, uh, if we build our software in a way that's not wasteful of natural resources, we can actually already by that be in a quite good space uh, for that. But I am super excited for today's topic. How are you feeling, Adi, about it? I'm super excited. I think today we're going to learn what the small steps that we can do in order to improve tomorrow's uh, situation. So definitely looking forward to your feedback, your comments, what we can do together, and of course your questions. For sure. And just as a bit of housekeeping from our part for this session, what are the kind of expectations? What are the what will you learn today? So we will kick things off by going through the green software space, explain you to some of the terminology, how to access your code and your software's uh, green function, so to say. Uh, and then we will do a bit of a deep dive into CADA and event-driven auto-scaling, as far as those things goes. And after that, we will look at the data side of it all. And you might be wondering, who are we? Uh, and why are we speaking here? So who are we, Adi? Who am I? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Andy Pollack. I work for Microsoft. I'm a senior manager at Microsoft. I have a master's degree in computer science uh, with a thesis in anomaly detection in graphs with complex node. I'm a writer of upcoming uh, O'Reilly book about uh, machine learning pipeline with Apache Spark uh, ecosystem. I'm a Databricks beacon. I work a lot with uh, Databricks and overall uh, Apache Spark open source uh, community. And I have about a decade, decade of experience, uh, hands-on experience, uh, building machine learning uh, modules and also scalable uh, infra data infrastructure. Annie, who are you? Yeah, who am I then? <laughs> uh, I am a CNCF ambassador. Uh, I'm an Azure MVP as well, as well as a Kubernetes and CNCF meetup co-organizer for around four years now for Finland. Uh, I am also the host and producer of cloudcosset.net podcast. I also coach early stage startups, and I also do product marketing at Cast AI, uh, which is a Kubernetes cost optimization company that are providing autonomous Kubernetes solutions. So very excited to be here today uh, doing this session. And then to set the scene for our session, to kind of kick it off with what are the, what's the situation at the moment. And I think particularly in this sense, um, when you think about industries, when you think about um, things that are causing a lot of emissions, that are causing a lot of pollution in the world, we don't typically think about the technology industry. We think about, for example, the airline industry. And I think it's a really interesting fact that actually the um, tech industry is either causing the same amount of emissions every year or even more than the airline industry. So tech or airline industry, both of them are very major players in the emissions per year category, honestly. So we are definitely not innocent in this sense. And I think it's only going to get um, even worse, so to say. Yeah, tapping into it, the, the rapid modern technology that we're seeing together with the digitalization process that took place during COVID-19, uh, where a lot of businesses went online, opened their, uh, either e-commerce or, or websites or anything like that. We definitely see a huge demand for compute power, which impact also the carbon emission that those uh, machines are polluting into, uh, into uh, our world, basically. Yeah, uh, and truly because of these two factors, uh, essentially if we don't act or we don't change one of these two factors, the world is going to experience an irreversible change in the climate that we can no longer, no longer control. So something has to change. So one of these two previous points will have to kind of bend. And, and obviously we as technology enthusiasts don't want it to bend from the second point probably, <laughs> but more from the first one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so 
But then again, why should you care? Because there's two philosophies of thought uh, within this space. Uh, number one is uh, if you know the, the the sustainability anger, the environmental impact is already itself a value, an important thing already on its own, and it is something that we should strive towards. But actually, the second part of the philosophies is then about okay, that is great, but then you also get a lot of. Um, organizational improvements on the top. Because if you're really thinking about your compute, if you really think about how you're building your software, that usually ends up with you uh, mastering your DevOps processes better, all of these things, and a lot of other benefits for your company or organization as well, which really leads to other things as well. Of course, on top of that, you get uh, improved performance, because for the same amount, the same unit of computes that we're paying for, we're basically getting more workloads done, because we're improving it to the level of maximum, maximum that we can take out of that that specific compute, which means we're also, it also leads to cost saving, because hey, we can serve more customers, we can generate more revenue, we can make more business with the same compute units. So once we're improving the performance, we're also saving on costs, so there's a benefit for, all, for everyone around us. Yeah. Yeah. It really leads to good savings as well. Uh, and the other uh, one of the points as well is sustainability goals. So this connects to, for example, if companies have internal or externally pushed sustainability goals that they have to meet, which are getting more and more common in the world. So this will help uh, companies push towards that, which obviously usually leads to better organizational improvements and, and goals as well, because that's really nice, as well as it helps us to meet the global sustainability goals that have been set to really meet uh, those, um, so that those changes would not happen in the world. Yeah, and actually in certain countries, for example, in Europe and Finland, right, there are specific rules about carbon emission. People are really pushing, the, the, the society and the economy are really pushing towards uh, um, carbon neutrality. Yeah. So this is a really important goal for some of the countries, and we definitely see how it's going to spread over the rest of the world. For sure. Uh, and last but not definitely not the least, saving the world. I think it's also very important and a nice perk as well. Yeah. Uh, and particularly, I think we all want to be like the superhero cat here to save the world and, and be the ones who are making the positive change in the world happen. Yeah, making sure this world is available for our grandchildren and grand-grandchildren or grand-cats and grand-grand-cats, depends on everyone's preference. Yeah, all the cats in the future as well. Uh, so yeah, so then a bit about principles of green software as well. Uh, after now we have set the scene, now we're moving on to how do you assess your environmental impact. So really, uh, there are a few basic things. There's carbon and e electricity, um, and this obviously connects to how much carbon does your compute uh, emit, or then how much electricity is needed to run your software, and these kind of things. But actually the thing that that's uh, not so often maybe discussed is the fact that it's not actually the net amount that's produced that matters as much, rather than the how much value do you get for that net amount that you put out. So then it really connects to carbon intensity. Intensity, yeah. yeah. Carbon intensity is basically a function that takes into consideration your carbon uh, units and your electricity units. So this is one of the functions that you might want to optimize for, so it will give you another a set of tool, another set of metrics in order to understand where you're standing in terms of carb uh, car consuming, uh, sorry, uh, producing carbon or emitting carbon versus consuming the electricity for the compute or for your cluster. And another point, this is a network efficiency. Because we also, often when we run compute, we have some data that we're transferring, we have some messaging that we're transferring. We want to be aware of how much data we're transferring, where we're transferring it to, because this also use compute, use RAM, use uh, a lot of resources. And that's actually going to shape uh, the demand, uh, that net neutrality is going to shape the demand in how we're using software and how we're consuming software and building those sustainable software. So all of those, uh, points going to help us assess how are we impacting uh, the, uh, the world, basically, how are we contributing to a green software, and also what are we doing to make it sustainable for us and for the next generations. Yeah, uh, and if that list was a bit scary or too much with the mathematical formulas and whatnot, <laughs> then there are three quick tips or areas that you could look into to kick off on your green software journey that we're going to talk to you through now. So first off, observability. Before you can start optimizing your clusters, because before you can start making your environment green, you have to actually understand what's happening in, within your clusters and your environments. 
Uh, and after you get that data, you actually can make data-driven decisions and you actually can start acting upon that to get to the other part, which is optimization. Yeah, once we get eyes into what's happening in our cluster using observability, we can start making decisions, right? We can start thinking how we want to optimize, measure the optimization impact, understand if it really had an impact or we thought it had an impact. So really try to start to play with that. And on top of that, we can overall add a layer of governance of how much uh, uh, polluting our, our software is, if it is even polluting, or if we are at uh, kind of a carbon neutrality space. So all of those points together can really help us make uh, better decisions. So if we're taking observability together with optimization, together with governance, we're actually generating awareness and kind of meeting our goals uh, of sustainable software. Yeah, that really helps with the governance for sure. Um, so then we're going to move on to giving some open source tooling uh, tips and support uh, that support the cause as well. Uh, so since uh, CNCF is close to everyone's heart here, CNCF projects can really get you started on your journey here as well. Uh, so here is a collection of CNCF projects that help you get uh, more observability or, or more optimization into your clusters, so you can get started with them. So you can use CADA for event-driven auto-scaling. We will do the deep dive to CADA next, uh, but that's already a tip here. And then you have also application management with Helm. You can use Prometheus for monitoring. You can use Flux for Container workflow, and then uh, we always, of course, recommend using a service mess. So there's Linkerd, Kuma, and whatnot. And of course, if you end up in a situation where you have multiple service messes and you need to manage all of them, Meshery is a great option to have the management plane there to for your service messes, so you can work with multiples at the same time. And uh, obviously, these really help you uh, on, in any pathway to really good optimization of your cluster, and therefore also the green software aspect of your cluster as well. Absolutely. So the CNCF tools are great in helping us optimizing the cluster, right? optimizing our compute. However, we still need to add this layer of observability to understand how the different compute uh, translate into carbon emission and, and carbon footprint overall. So for example here, there is a project named Impact. It's not part of the CNCF, but it's a project uh, that helps us track uh, and kind of calculate how much uh, uh, carbon footprint our machine learning workloads are generating. So we're getting, we're going into the project, we're putting in the number of machines we're using, the type of machines, if we're using CPU or GPU, how long, which cluster, which cloud that we use, and it's going to give us the, the carbon footprint. So this is one of the steps that we need to take in order to create that observability layer. And there are more tools, of course, part of the OpenSustain.tech that help us track that on different devices. If I'm using IoT devices or if I'm using a different kind of uh, hardware, all of those tools are going to help me create that uh, observability layer in order for us to estimate how the great CNCF projects that we have helping us optimizing and reaching those uh, and reducing the carbon footprint uh, that we're creating. Yeah, which is the end goal, of course, here. And uh, another great tip, uh, Green Software Foundation, which is a, a relatively new foundation that has been started. It's under the Linux Foundation umbrella as well. Uh, so they really aim to gather a lot of the resources that we are talking about here, a lot of the people that are excited about this topic under one umbrella, so that we can all get together and work on these um, issues and goals and, and all of these things together, because there is more power in community and teams working together, obviously, as well. So that's really wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah, and then now jumping into the auto-scaling, event-driven, Kato part of our session. Yeah, taking it into practice. All those good insights, good topics, good ideas. Now we want to make it real. Yes, for sure. Um, so really, this connects to what I was talking in the beginning. If you auto-scale your uh, clusters, your environment, then you're not wasting any resources because you're only acting with your um, environment when uh, there's actually a need for it, not constantly. So that really leads your processes as well. Uh, so then uh, it really begs the question, what is event-driven architecture? Well, um, well, this is an answer that, a question that was answered many, many times, uh, but we'll just repeat it, we'll make it very short. It's basically an architecture that is centered around events. It means we're producing, detecting, detecting, consuming, and reaction to events that we're collecting. It can be payment, it can be a customer, uh, it can be tweets that we're sending out uh, to the world. And the thing is, with event-driven architecture, we need to make sure we're able to scale. Because often we're going to hit some picks, we need to handle a lot of events, we need to make sure we have good throughputs of the event, even in case of uh, peak in events. 
And another great uh, and very important point and criteria of that architecture, this is the message delivery. Because each event need to have, uh, we need to make a decision in advance how we, want to, how we want to process that message. If we want to make sure we're processing it exactly once, for example, for financial transaction, we want to make sure each financial transaction is being processed exactly once. We're not losing any, any one of them. We're not accidentally processing it twice and charging someone uh, twice, for example. Uh, and another message deliveries that are not related to the finance world uh, that much. This is the at most once. So I, I know I'm going to process the message at most once, so maybe twice, maybe three times, or at least uh, once. So, yeah. yeah. Important things for sure. Uh, so, what is CADA? As we have mentioned CADA so many times in this presentation already, we gotta go deep into what it actually is and what does it do. Uh, so, CADA really answers the issue of that default Kubernetes scaling is not really well suited for event driven applications, it's more for memory and CPU. So, this is exactly the issue that CADA is, is solving within the Kubernetes space. So, it's event driven scale controlling so that they can run inside any Kubernetes cluster so that it can monitor the rate of events to preemptively act before CPU is actually affected. So this is where the power relies. Uh, you can install it into a new or, new or existing clusters, and it provides 30 plus built-in scalers, so you can kind of extend your CADA as well. And you can build your own scalers as well, and it has support for external scalers, external push, or metrics API as well. But then we can have a bit of a look deeper even into CADA and, and see how it works. Yeah, let's assume we have kind of a generic e-commerce system. So we know we have customers that are generating events. We know we have orders, right? They're putting in orders. We know we have shipments that also generate events. And then we have events from the warehouse. So without CADA there, we need to handle, Kubernetes help us handle uh, the growth in, uh, in, uh, in the need to process it using something called HPI. So the horizontal uh, HPA, the horizontal pod autoscaler. And the horizontal pod autoscaler is based on matrices that related to compute, things like CPU cycle, RAM, et cetera. And I can define the threshold. So for example, if I'm reaching a specific amount of uh, consum consumption from the CPU or a specific amount of usage of RAM, then, it will, then Kubernetes will start rolling out and adding more and more pods. Those all matrices can be collected also and sent to different services on the cloud. So if we're running and using, for example, AWS, we have the metric uh, adapter there. It's part of the AWS CloudWatch. Uh, if we're running with Prometheus, we can leverage that. We can also connect it to some information that we can collect from Kafka. And if we're running it, for example, on the Azure cloud, we can connect it to uh, Azure monitoring and then make decision. We can bring in all the information from the different messaging services on Azure. So while this is nice, uh, it still not, doesn't know how to support the amount of messages. It's true we can kind of leverage Prometheus in order to collect you know, information from the Kafka brokers into how much message is there, but it doesn't give us this kind of a generic platform in order to connect a lot of different services into it. We have to handle each one of them individually. And this is why we want to have Keda in there. So Keda basically it's a defined service that we can deploy on top of Kubernetes that's going to enrich the Kubernetes API. And what it does, it's listening into the amount of messages in different uh, messaging systems. So it can be Kafka, it can be a service bus, it could be any other uh, messaging system that uh, we want. A lot of the messaging system, those scholars that we talked about, more than 30 scholars are already supported by the community. So thank you so much for everyone who contributed to it and added those uh, uh, scalers. And Later on, it's, what, what it does, it's taking the amount of messages and translate it into matrices that Kubernetes knows how to uh, make a decision if you want to scale it up and scale it down. So that brings us to the next slide. So it does, what it does inside, we're defining our YAML, like how many, for how many messages we want to start scaling up our Kubernetes cluster. And after we define those, those amount of messages, what it does, it's going to translate it back into uh, CPU and into RAM and uh, translate it into the horizontal code autoscaler that knows what to do from there. So we're kind of tricking the system, but what it does it helps us understand, it helps us scale up before we're actually reaching the limits of compute, of RAM, or, or CPU. Once those messages are in the system, 
it already sent the command to, to Kubernetes to scale up my cluster. And that's really great when I need to have a good throughput of messaging when there are peaks. So it knows how to scale up. It also knows how to scale down. So this is great for optimizing our compute. This is great for helping us uh, reach the, that carbon uh, neutrality that we really care about. So always remember, it knows how to scale up, it knows how to scale down, and everything there we can define, of course, through uh, our YAML. Yeah. So now getting into our demo for today. Um, so this is uh, abstract representation of the demo architecture. So you have the order portal there, order processor, Azure service bus, order generator, all of these parts. There's the front end, the back end, and whatnot. Um, uh, and this is a very abstract representation. But what you can think about this demo while it's running is that we uh, we would be running a web shop, for example, for Halloween masks or anything that has a very kind of high peak of demand at some point. Yeah. So we need a system that can really scale up and down afterward that peak of everyone rushing in and getting those masks at Come the on, same Annie, time. Kick, us, <laughs> kick, kick off our Halloween uh, yes, shop. <laughs> I will. Uh, so then obviously gonna go here to pick up all of these things. So now you should see all of these. Things. Let's switch this a bit closer here. So we see a bit better. So. In here, we have, you see a few of my terminals, many of them, because there's going to be a lot of things happening. So with this command of kubectl and get services, we will get to see, okay, we get the external IP where we get this uh, Kata samples order portal that we will be seeing a lot of action in the future. I have already opened it up because uh, I'm prepared, but let's just refresh it so that we know for sure that it is working very well. That's beautiful. And then uh, we get to add a few more of these terminals working so we get a bit more visibility into seeing what will happen within the demo. So in here we have uh, the, where we see how many order processors we have ready and up to date and so forth. And then if we go to the last terminal, did you see that's very small here? Uh, we will put the kubectl get pods here so that we see uh, what's the status as far as this goes. So is it running, is it creating, or is it terminating the order processors here? So then we get to the active and very honestly fast-paced part of this demo, which is gonna be very fast, so don't blink or you will miss it. Uh, so we put this command in. Uh, which is .NET run, and then we will get a question. Uh, let's queue some orders. How many do you want? And this is the part we say that 100 orders are coming in at the same time, and it's going to be crazy. So here we go. The orders are coming in. It's coming very fast. We see the order queue spiking up. We see it getting to the 100 mark. We see here everything is responding correctly. We see order processors pending, container creating, and then starting to go to the running phase as well. So this is Akeda then meeting the demand that's happening with the 100 orders suddenly just jumping in. And you can then see that now the, the queue is being handled. So the order queue is going down. So we're going down from the 100 mark very nicely. We can see the order processors. There's six out of eight. Oh, well, I was too slow. So there's eight out of eight years in now already. And then we have still, we have everything running now. No more container creating or pending, for example. So that's where we are at the moment. And now we see the order queue getting even slower and slower and um, to smaller. So then we are simply just running the order processors as well as just keeping them at 10 out of 10. So everything is working perfectly. No demo issues here so far. Yeah. And I know that was quite fast and it's just everything moved a lot. There was a lot of orders, a lot of things happening. But uh, now we will actually take you through what actually happened and what does this mean. Yeah, so let's break it down a little bit. We actually have a Kubernetes cluster on top of the Azure cloud. So we're leveraging something called AKS, Azure Kubernetes uh, Service. So that's a managed service. We also have message, uh, message Bus. So Message Bus is a messaging service, also part of the Azure family. What we did here, we kind of mimicked the logic of uh, web uh, of uh, e-commerce. Uh, we kicked off uh, deployment. We deployed in Kubernetes the uh, order processor, so it processes all the events that comes into the system. We also kicked off an application that generate those events, so we're kind of mimicking those events as well. And it decided to to get us at 
100 event, we can also support 1,000 event if you want. We've seen on the order queue length how the orders are getting in and how fast it goes down. And the reason it went down is because Kata kicked in, Kata was kicked in and started creating more and more pods for the same uh, de deployment. So our order processor, instead of having one replica, now got multiple replicas. So this is what happened. And now after we finish processing, Kata is checking uh, to make sure everything is actually finished. And then what it's going to do, it's going to slowly terminate uh, the, uh, the unnecessary compute, sort of removing uh, some of the pods. And soon we're going to see it here, still, still it's uh, running, uh, yeah. so we'll give it a, a, couple, bit of while. a couple of more seconds. But let's take a look at the YAML file. Yeah, let's take a look at that while we wait. Uh, and then we can also talk a bit about the environmental impact after that. Uh, but here you see, uh, you see the YAML file here, and in here you would normally have uh, There, in here, you would normally see the replica, uh, replica counts that, that we would be, you know, saying that one, two, three, you know, the set amount of replicas. But in here, we don't actually see them, which is then the fun part because they are actually in in this other place, other area. So in here, we actually see that it's not a set replica amount, but it's a uh, minimum replica amount and then the maximum replica account. So this really shows us that you know it's not a set amount, but it's the scale that we can work with on, on how many we have at our disposal. Yeah. Thank you for diving a little bit deeper. Sorry. Thank you. So if we're diving a little bit deeper, we see this file is actually defining our deployment, right? So this is the application that's going to process the events. Uh, and you can see here it named order processor. And like Annie mentioned, there's, there's no replica there, right? So what is happening behind the scene with the autoscaler? So here we're connecting it directly into Kata. This is kind of a scaled object, so Kata knows what to do. And we're connecting it through the scale target reference. Right, so we're using the same name, so it knows where, how, to, how to kick it off. And what are the triggers that we are defining here? We define the Azure service bus, but of course there are multiple triggers that you can pick uh, out, of a, out of a long list. And our queue name is orders, right? So you can see it here under the queue name, and the message count is five. So every five message that it detects, I'm going to spin another, uh, another process uh, to trigger that. Uh, so this is kind of the metadata behind it, and of course there is authentication process and secret and all of uh, the things uh, we need to see here. Yeah, and, and truly the environmental impact is here so that, you know, when there is no order processors working, there's no, no nothing happening, then we are simply not, you know, destroying the trees. Uh, we are not consuming any wasted resources or anything, but we only have the resources that we need at that point when we actually need them. So we are then using the resources and then we are scaling down on exactly when we don't anymore need them. So this means that we are being very conscious of how much of um, cloud waste, how much environmental resources. So all of the things that I mentioned before, electricity, carbon, all of these things are being conserved at a really good rate so that we know what we're doing and we know that we are auto scaling to the need that's happening. Yeah. Uh, so we optimized for resources, right? We opt we optimized the cluster to reach the performance that we need also because we needed those machines at this time. And now we're kind of yeah, kicking and them away and terminating how, yeah. them if you can see it under in the green screen how uh, Keda is terminating uh, those machines. Yes, Keda is terminating them one by one. And then we see here in the blue terminal, we see that it's down to zero completely already. So that was that fast we went. We had 100 orders, we scaled up, and then we had no longer 100 orders, we got the queue handled, and now it's down to zero again. So no resources wasted, all done automatically by Keda. We did not have to, you know, fiddle with anything or whatnot during the order amount that was happening. Yeah. Um, Thank yeah. you to the Wi-Fi here that uh, <laughs> treat us well today. Yeah, the Wi-Fi is the true <laughs> hero in this story. Uh, but yeah, so then let's continue with the presentation. Uh, so this demo was scaling .NET Core Worker with Azure Service Bus. And um, no demo effect there, so we're very happy. Everything went smoothly. 
Cool. So we covered compute. We know how we can uh, get a better compute for and get better throughput based on the messages that we have in our queue. But what about messaging our data in a distributed environment, right? Because once I have a Kubernetes cluster, I need to take into consideration what the different workloads that I'm running on top of my Kubernetes. What is the compute that I'm actually doing? Is that a stateful compute or is that a stateless compute? And if I'm going with stateful, it's a totally different game because we want to optimize data movement. Often we, when we're using things like Apache Spark and things uh, like a distributed computing environment, we want to make sure we're optimizing the data movement over the network. Uh, if you're familiar with the concept of shuffling, for example, when we need to shuffle the data into multiple machines, and we also need to adhere to the needs of our data customers in our organization. We need to make sure our data has a good quality in it. Everything is tracked, everything is there, everything is fast, they're able to access everything that we need. And we need to overall manage the data lifecycle on top of our Kubernetes uh, cluster. So let's take a look at another architecture example where we actually need exactly once uh, eigenpotency uh, computation for each message. message. And idem potency means I'm going to uh, calculate some function or I'm going to do some mathematical, you know, uh, around that message, but I'm going to make sure I'm doing it exactly once and not more than that. And even if I'm going to uh, either run another set of computation on top of the exact uh, message, it's not going to change the outcome. So this is a more challenging aspect in the world uh, of data. So here in this high-level architecture, we're actually leveraging Kafka to do it. So we have Kafka producer, we have producer A, producer B, that produce a lot of events into our system. And then we have Kafka consumers that are surrounded, kind of by, supported by, by our CADA uh, service. And the CADA service know how to scale up when we need. And we're leveraging Kafka consumer stream API. And the reason I'm using Kafka here for IDM potency for exactly once, that's because my service bus um, that is part of the, of the Azure family is actually not supporting exactly one. So this is why I'm using uh, Kafka here. But the challenge, uh, the challenge here that after everything, um, after I kind of consumed that message and I did that commit, I need to make sure I still have another layer that helps me measure the data quality on the distributed world, right? Because then I want to plug it in into some other reports, maybe uh, other compute analytics system like Databricks or Synapse or our Data Hub or anything like that that I want to work with. But the challenges that I have with my cloud object storage is sometimes it doesn't give me that capability to track what really happens with my data throughout uh, between each distributed uh, compute. And this is why we're adding here another layer of a new open source, a new kid on the block uh, named uh, LakeFS. So LakeFS is a new open source that's going to help us solve a little bit of what of uh, challenges or kind of the problems that are still in uh, part of the object storage. So what LakeFS gives us? LakeFS gives us source control for object storage. So we you know it sounds a little bit weird, but we'll touch it more. But zooming into that specific uh, uh, open source, it helps us verify the output. So for every iteration that I'm doing, I can track and verify the output. I can verify the schema. I can make sure I don't have any fault data in it. I have a good schema ver verification. I have a good format in you. It helps me uh, understand the delivery guarantees. I need to make sure the delivery is exactly as I need it to be. And of course, it helps me measure uh, quality and compliance. So let's take a step back and think, wait, source control for object storage? We often do source control for code, right? We have Git. Get is a source control for code. So like we control, the same way that we control code, we can start controlling data. So thinking about GitHub for data. So what is a source control for data? Where can we run it? We can run it in a production environment for a Kubernetes cluster, on staging, sandbox, dev, everywhere where we have a distributed or we're dealing with big data on top of, on top of Kubernetes or other uh, distributed environment. Why we want to do it? We want to have complete verification of the data before it's being used by our data customers. We want to have this observability layer, but not only observability layer, something that we can actually take actions on top of. It can help us with reproducibility. It can help us with data versioning. And the nice thing about LakeFS, it does data versioning with zero copy branching. So this is super cool because that really helps me make sure I'm staying in the space of carbon neutral. I don't want to copy my data for every version. I want to have zero copy branching for that. I can revert because I have branching. So if something bad going on with my 
large-scale data in production on top of Kubernetes, some pod decided to die to me uh, in the middle of you know, a Spark job, then I can revert uh, without any issues. And the nice thing about it, it's open source, it's cloud agnostic, and it's a distributed computing uh, platform agnostic as well. So you can connect it to anything uh, that we want. And the system of the different branches that we can create, we can actually insert tests inside of production. So for example, we can leverage YAML to create those webhooks for validating the data flows in our production environment. So we are doing separation of controls. Once our developers are developing the logic, we can also have data ops people developing those webhooks to make sure we're not exposing any secrets or any information to kind of making sure the data has the best quality. Although we're running in a distributed compute and we don't need to add any uh, ETL process in between. So think about it as building an actionable data observability layer for sustainable software. Because it gives us eyes into what happens in the big data space that's running on my Kubernetes, which is one of the biggest challenges we're facing today. If anyone here ever worked with the Hadoop ecosystem and tried to kind of take what, everything we had on Hadoop and work on Kubernetes, it's very hard because we don't have we don't have that observability into what's happening with our data. It's mostly around metrics that's related to compute. Yeah. And with that, we want to connect it back to our vision. Yes, yeah, so, so the vision for uh, connecting to the green software world, essentially, as well. So we have seen airline industries do this. So they have one tab of, you know, I will offset my carbon footprint of my flight. Wouldn't it be amazing if the tech world would produce something similar? So we would have, for example, Kata Scaler for optimizing your compute uh, and auto-scaling it for, um, for green uh, metrics as well. Or we could have cost optimization companies, performance optimization companies, anyone who's dealing with these kind of questions, creating solutions uh, that where you can actually optimize and see more into the green aspects of your software as well. And then this is kind of what we would want to see being built and we want to be part of building as well in the future. Yeah, so imagine that for every observability, the tools that you're using, you're actually having another box there that says carbon emission, how we can optimize it. So we're actually connecting it to the values of people, what we want to achieve, and kind of creating those green, green world while also making sure we're optimizing for compute and cost. Yeah, that's the plan, that's the vision. But yeah, that's uh, a few resources here. Obviously, check out Keda, and thank you for Keda for helping us with the demo and everything to do with these. And then, obviously, uh, here are a few resources, or a great short course on, on sustainable software and engineering from Microsoft, as well as I wrote an article about organizational view into these topics, so check that out as well. And then the slides and materials, as always, you can find them from GitHub, and uh, we're going to have them uh, at a lot of places as well, so stay yeah. tuned for those. And, and thank you for Tom and everyone in the CNCF uh, community and the Keta community that helps us build those products and really make it uh, enable us to optimize those, those clusters. So thank you so much for, for doing the great job that you're doing.